Ms. Hildebrandt, this, this circumstance is tragic. It's largely, of course, of your making. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Therapy Today. Today we are going to be doing a reaction video to what I hope might be the conclusion of the Jody Hildebrand case. As you are well aware, we've been following this case from the very beginning when Ruby Frankie's children were found in Jody Hildebrand's home to when she was charged to all of the drama with her selling her house and being sued by Kevin Frankie for damages and restitution to now we are finally at the sentencing hearing. So Law and Crime Network posted this video of Jody Hildebrand and her sentencing hearing. She makes a statement herself and we find out what the final sentence is from the state of Utah for the crimes of child abuse in this instance. So we'll just be following along. I'll be reacting to what she says, what the judge says, what her lawyer has to say, things like that. Please make sure you like and subscribe. Stay up to date with all of our content because we're going to be doing a reaction video to Ruby Frankie's sentencing hearing as well here in the next couple of days. So be sure to stay tuned for that and let's dive into it. Court recalls the matter of State of Utah versus Hildebrand. Case 2315-01763. Counsel are present. Ms. Hildebrand is present. Counsel, there is a pre-sentence investigation report. I have read it. Everyone has seen and reviewed that. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Again, the sentence was stipulated at the time of the plea agreement. What, what record do we need to make other than going forward with sentencing? Okay, just to catch you up to speed, Jody Hildebrand took a plea deal. There were initially, I believe, six counts of child abuse, and she pled down to four counts, and each of those four counts carries, I think, one to 15 years of time in prison. And after the date of the hearing of her plea deal, there was going to be an investigation. I guess it was called a pre-sentencing investigation. Please correct me in the comments, lawyers, if I'm incorrect on that. But a pre-sentencing investigation where I guess the court, the different lawyers could gather information to be able to better inform whether the sentences should be served consecutively or concurrently, which means one after another or all of them together at the same time, as well as maybe the severity of the situation to determine whether we're looking at closer to one year or closer to 15 years for each of those counts. So I guess that's what we're discussing now. I, Your Honor, I, it, it would be repetitive. I, so I, I had the same statement just with the last few paragraphs where, where I was differentiating between Ms. Frankie and Ms. Hildebrand. Okay, let's talk about about housekeeping matters first. What about restitution? We, we've stipulated to keep that open for eight months. It is appropriate, Your Honor, since we don't have any evidence with respect to restitution, and that's because it is still in the process of being gathered by uh, the county attorney's office. It's, a, it's completely appropriate for the court to make no orders with respect to restitution other than to reserve all issues regarding restitution, and we have no issue with the eight-month eight uh, uh, time frame. And the injunction that was previously issued by the court will remain in effect? It will. In, at least until that time? It will remain in effect until further order of this court. All right. What my untrained ear is hearing is that Kevin Frankie had filed for restitution from Jody Hildebrandt because she was supposed to be the therapist for the family and she had caused all these damages to the kids, to filing for restitution so that these kids' medical bills, psychology, therapy, psychiatry, any other medical stuff, would be covered by Jody Hildebrand's money and not the family's money, which makes sense given that she was the cause of a lot of these hurts. And what I'm hearing is that the district attorney's office is not ready to make a recommendation one way or another, or they're still gathering information. And so they're agreeing to an eight month delay or stay or whatever it's called before the restitution issue gets decided. And I think the injunction is probably referring to Jody Hildebrandt was trying to sell her house. I think ostensibly in the previous video, representation for Kevin Frankie was saying that she was trying to sell the house so that she could hide away that money and not have that be part of what she might have to give up in a restitution case. I don't know about that. That is my guess based on what I am hearing. So again, lawyers, people who are familiar with the legal system, please let me know in the comments what you think is going on here. But all in all, Beyond just the simple restitution between someone who has caused harm to another person, that's all pretty cut and dry when we talk about normal like car accidents even. There are settlements and payments to cover damages and things like that. But we're also in a situation where we're talking about somebody, Jody Hildebrandt, who was in a professional position who had committed malpractice towards these children and towards this family. 
and towards a bunch of other families too, but that's not pertinent to this case. I could see there being an argument for further punitive damages or further money that she has to pay beyond just the medical costs for the kids because she was in this position where she was supposed to be the professional, she was supposed to be acting ethically, she was supposed to be the trained person, and she was not fulfilling her duty to the family. In fact, she was actually actively causing harm to the family and especially the two kids who were tied up, tortured, beaten multiple times while under her care. Mr. Clark. Thanks, Your Honor. The state of Utah respectfully requests that the court sentence Ms. Hildebrandt to consecutive prison terms for each of the four counts of aggravated child abuse to which she has pleaded guilty. The sentence was agreed to her in her plea agreement and is also recommended by adult probation and parole. Ms. Hildebrandt committed awful acts of child abuse. From May to August 2023, she and her business partner held two children, ages 9 and 11, turning 12, in a concentration camp-like setting in her house in Ivan City. The children were regularly denied food, water, beds to sleep in, and virtually all forms of entertainment. They were isolated from others and were hidden when people came to visit the house. They were forced to do physical tasks, like carrying loaded boxes up and down stairs and doing wall sits or sitting against a wall without assistance of a chair or stool for hours at a time. They were forced to do manual labor outdoors in the extreme summer heat, often without shoes or socks. They were also forced to stand outside on a cement patio in the summer heat for hours and even days. They were beaten, and the 12-year-old was regularly bound hand and foot after he attempted to run away in mid-July. Both children had extensive physical injuries from the abuse that required hospitalization to treat. The injuries from the binding are particularly bad. In addition to the physical abuse, the children were emotionally abused. They each believed to some degree that they deserved what was being done to them. Had the older of the two children not had the courage to run away and ask a neighbor to call the police, heaven only knows how much longer he could have survived. Wow, that is... I know Jody Hildebrand's making a statement later, but I don't know how you recover from that. that... Those are torture methods. You're talking from, I think, May to August. You're talking about the hottest months of the year. Admittedly, I'm not familiar with Utah's climate. You're talking about working on pavement barefoot with the blazing sun overhead, being forced to wall sit for hours at a time, carrying heavy boxes up and down steps, being beaten, being tied up when they tried to escape. And especially that piece really seems to hit home that Jody Hildebrandt knew exactly what she was doing, that there was an intentionality behind all of these choices that she made with the way that she disciplined but really abused these children, hiding them away when other people came over so that people wouldn't see the marks maybe or be able to get a clue that something wrong was going on in her house. So you see these very strategic moves to make sure that nobody would ever find out. And so she knew that what she was doing was wrong and not well-intentioned whatsoever. After being caught, Ms. Hildebrandt has shown little to no remorse for her actions. In telephone conversations that will be provided in full to the Board of Pardons and Parole, and which she knew to be recorded, she's repeatedly claimed that she is the victim and the children are the perpetrators. I want to touch on this point too, because that is basically what she's been teaching these kids through this torture. And we talked about in a previous video when the Law and Crime Network interviewed Jesse Hildebrandt, the niece of Jody Hildebrandt, who stayed with her for maybe a year or less, but a lot of these tactics were the same that Jesse Hildebrand experienced, that these kids now experienced under Jody Hildebrand's care, where they were taught that they were evil or possessed in some way, and all of these punishments were meant to be for their benefit and that they had earned or deserved those punishments somehow. And so in these phone calls, which, man, I would really love to have access to and be able to hear what those conversations were about, Jody Hildebrandt was saying that she's the victim in all of this and I guess somehow the kids are the ones causing her trouble. But again, same pattern as with Jesse Hildebrandt. Jesse Hildebrandt said that they had their name dragged through the mud when they tried to speak out for their own safety and saying that Jody Hildebrandt was doing terrible things to them, that Jody Hildebrandt made Jesse Hildebrandt seem unreliable, lying, 
trying to destroy people's lives so that her credibility didn't mean anything and she couldn't speak up for herself. And it seems like the same pattern is repeating itself here. She's gone so far as to say that the things said in this proceeding and covered by the media today will be full of lies. The combination of three factors make Ms. Hildebrand a significant threat to the community. First, the severity of the abuse she caused to be inflicted on young children. Second, her attitude that everything she did was justified and that she is being wrongfully imprisoned. And third, her training as a therapist and aptitude for using online resources to convince others to follow her guidance. You That's the first time I've heard her being described as a threat to the community. And we don't normally think of therapists in that way. But based on what this person is saying, this attorney is saying, that makes a lot of sense. First was the direct harm that she caused to the Frankie children. Then you talk about her attitude in the phone calls apparently that they have access to and were recorded and she knew were recorded, saying that this is gonna be full of lies, that she doesn't deserve to be imprisoned. That shows a lack of remorse on her part and that if she happened to be released, she would have no reason to change the way she was functioning because she doesn't believe that she was in the wrong. And then finally, like they're saying, the training that she has as a therapist and her ability to convince people, her ability to sell her products online, make for a wider threat because it's not just her now, but she can teach other people, she can influence other people to potentially parent the same way that she did, to believe the same things that she did, which could lead to a lot more abuse down the line for parents who follow her method of parenting and teaching children. And again, this speaks to the level of responsibility that we as therapists have. We are given this training where we are taught how to build trust with people. We are taught how to influence change in people. And if that is done inappropriately, unethically, with evil intent, that can really be harmful on a community-wide level, not just an individual level. Utah Code Section 76-3401 lays out three factors the court should consider in determining whether to impose concurrent or consecutive sentences. The first is the gravity and circumstances of the offense. The second is the number of victims. And the third is the history, character, and rehabilitative need of the defendant. As agreed to in the plea agreement and as recommended by adult probation and parole, consecutive sentences are appropriate here. This is due to the severity of the abuse to the two victims and the extreme need for Ms. Hildebrandt to be rehabilitated so that she no longer will present a risk to the community. I don't know who's going to have the job of rehabbing Jody Hildebrandt, but that is going to be a tough case. And for all the commenters and the discourse around, you know, other families, other victims speaking out over the course of this process about how Jody Hildebrandt had harmed them in the past, what this attorney is saying, that third criteria is the history and character of Jody Hildebrandt having an influence for the argument of whether she should be serving consecutive or concurrent sentences. So I think this is where the stories of people like Adam Steed, Jesse Hildebrandt, other victims who have spoken out in the past couple of months can be really influential. And I think that would have been part of the pre-sentencing investigation for people to share their stories, for attorneys to gather this information so that they can make that recommendation that this was not a one-off situation, but a long-standing pattern of the way that Jody Hildebrandt has treated clients, patients, and how she has twisted their narratives to serve her purposes, to make money off of them, and to tarnish their own credibility so that she can walk away from the situation without any punishment. The state respectfully requests that she be sentenced to four consecutive terms. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Terry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will be brief. As is always the case in cases that come before courts, there are two sides to every case. And as, um, and even in a case like this, that remains the case. He doesn't sound convinced by what he's saying himself. There are two sides, yes, but I don't know what side is going to argue that Jody Hildebrandt deserves maybe a lesser sentence in this case. Um, there are many, many allegations regarding these two individuals, Miss um, Frankie and my client, Miss Hildebrand. The only facts 
in this case that are adjudicated facts are those set forth in the plea agreement. Okay, legal experts, again, I'm going to call on you for the comment section below. What are the adjudicated facts in this case? Is it the facts that both the state and the defense agree on because it's set forth in the plea agreement? Because I think there are a lot of other details and facts that probably came out in the investigation, but I guess he's saying that those shouldn't be considered in some way. Again, I'm confused here. To my untrained ear, I don't know exactly what's going on, so let me know in the comments. She entered into that she entered into freely and knowingly and voluntarily. Those facts, those adjudicated facts, are significant. They certainly provide a basis for the pleas and provide a basis for the stipulated sentence in this case. My experience with Ms. Hildebrandt is that she is not the person that she has been portrayed to be. But having said that, she has accepted responsibility in this case. She has entered into this plea agreement with a stipulated sentence of four consecutive uh, sentences. She did that at the time she entered into the plea agreement, knowing that that would be the court's order. She is before the court today, knowing that that would be the court's order, and she fully accepts that. She accepts responsibility and she accepts the consequences for her conduct. I don't know that both of those can be true. The first lawyer representing the state said in her phone call she was not accepting responsibility because she said she's being wrongfully imprisoned, she doesn't deserve this, and that the court proceedings are full of lies about her, and her attorney is saying that she accepts full responsibility. I don't think both of those can be true at the same time. And based on her track record, I know which one I believe more than the other. Um, and we will submit it to the court on the stipulated agreement. Mr. Terry, you suggested that there, there are two sides to every case. I generally agree with you. Ms. Hildebrand didn't make a statement to AP&P in, in the course of the pre-sentence investigation report. Correct. Why did she not? Make a, make a statement. She wanted to reserve her right to make a statement before the court today, and she has a brief statement that she wants to read, Your Honor. Okay. And, and All right. I, Ms. Hildebrandt. Go ahead. I sincerely love these children. I desire for them to heal physically and emotionally. One of the reasons I did not go to trial is that I did not want them to emotionally relive the experience which would have been detrimental to them. This does not ring very true to me considering she was the reason for the emotional and physical harm that they have to heal from. And again, we're talking about this is a pattern over months and months at the very least in this case from May to August. We don't know other patterns of abuse that she might have perpetrated in the past with the Frankie kids specifically, but we also hear stories of other abuses in the past with other families. And so just the whole track record really doesn't help me to be convinced that she might suddenly be sorry or that she just made a mistake because she was not thinking about what was good for the kids throughout the entirety of her time taking care of them and it's just now when sentencing is on the line and how long she's spending in prison is on the line that she seems to care or she says she cares about the welfare of the kids. My hope and prayer is that they will heal and move forward to have beautiful lives. I agree with that. I hope they heal and recover and live beautiful lives as well, and they probably would have been closer to that track had they not happened to hook up with this therapist. I am willing to submit to what the state feels would be an appropriate amount of time served to make restitution as an outcome. And in answer to your question, Your Honor, I knew that whatever she might say to the author of the pre-sentence report would probably be sound uh, hollow or, and self-serving, and perhaps it does today. But I know that my client, in the statement that she makes to the court today, that, that, that 
that statement is absolutely sincere. This guy's fighting such an uphill battle. He knows what the public perception is around his client, but he still has to say these things. And he even acknowledges in the courtroom proceedings that maybe her statement doesn't sound very genuine in this case or at any point during any of the investigative hearings, but he's still got it go through the motions and say those things and try to do what he can for her. Man, I do not envy this guy his job. Not does, does Hildebrandt recognize that it's her behavior that, that caused the harm to the children that she's referred to in her statement? I'm sorry, I got a laughing. The judge isn't having any of it. Your Honor, she recognizes that she was, along with Miss Frankie, um, that, that she made decisions with respect to the discipline of those children that were wrong, that caused harm to those children. She fully recognizes that and accepts responsibility for that. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Hildebrandt, this this circumstance is tragic. It's largely, of course, of your making. By any measure, your conduct in this case was disastrous for these children. Adults are supposed to protect children. Adults with specialized training in particular are supposed to protect children. This is what I've been talking about throughout this case. Adults are supposed to protect children, parents especially, and we'll talk about that in the Ruby Frankie case. Um, again, that will be recording here in a couple of days. But especially when you've been given special privileges legally through the State Board of Licensing, by the power in Jody Hildebrand's case of being referred by the church, you are given a lot of privilege and you need to hold that very carefully and wield that very carefully. And I do think that sometimes therapists, us in the mental health field, get a little chip in our shoulders about like not being considered real medical professionals or that, you know, mental health is not a real science or psychology is not a real science, stuff like that. But that doesn't change that the work that we do is highly influential. And if we start to devalue that in our own minds, we can start to excuse that, oh, you know, if I don't do a great job, it doesn't really matter. If I'm not super invested in this client, it doesn't really matter. It does matter because when we start taking advantage of our position, this is where it can lead. You didn't do that in this case. In this, in this case, you terrorized children and the results have been tragic. It's what happened to these children and your philosophy in dealing with them frankly seems detached from reality or any objective standard of decency. So I think the judge is really onto something here and this is why it's important for us as therapists to be able to explain the interventions that we're using and how they are backed by evidence-based practices and evidence-based theories. So we're not just making stuff up as we go and saying that, oh yeah, this will be therapeutic because I thought of it or because I heard, you know, this person who knows this person did this and it worked. So I don't know if he's necessarily touching on that, but yes, her reasoning for a lot of these practices that she used on the kids, other kids and other families is not grounded in reality and it's not grounded in good research, clearly. Or, or even common sense. And the court finds that it is appropriate that you serve a prison sentence the court finds under the statute, Utah Code 76-3-401, that given the gravity and circumstances of the offenses, the number of victims, and the history and character and needs of the defendant, that consecutive sentences are appropriate. The court imposes four 1-15 to 15 year sentences to be, again, served consecutively for each of the four counts of aggravated child abuse. Wow. So... The judge left me hanging in a little bit. He still said one to 15 years served consecutively, so that was determined. But I don't know if there's something else later on that they'll actually determine how many years for each count of aggravated child abuse. I don't know how that works exactly. But I am glad that the gravity of the situation was not lost on the judge. 
that the pre-sentencing investigation seemed to turn up some of the issues with Jody Hildebrand's character and the way that she was viewing the proceedings as being dishonest or that she was being unfairly treated, as well as potentially the history of her work as a therapist and as a caregiver and how that's just merely extended to this latest case that she was found out on. So again, I think the major takeaway for a therapist or anyone in the mental health professions watching this, take your job seriously. There are gonna be times where we feel like phoning it in and even if we don't go to the lengths of intentionally abusing clients, we can still do harm unintentionally. And that's why taking care of ourselves is super important, watching our mental health so that we can be at our best for our clients and also for ourselves. I am interested in whether there will be follow-up, I guess, kind of civil cases between the different victims who she has hurt over the years and how that all shakes out with this guilty plea and how that all adds to some of the financial restitution and some of the implications for unethical practice for other mental health clinicians and providers. Everyone, thank you so much for checking out this video with me. This is hard to watch because this hurts the mental health professions. Seeing the harm that somebody in my position can do with relatively similar licensure and training, that hurts that someone would take that and abuse that to the point where you're torturing kids, separating families, and causing so much harm, both physically and mentally. So I think that's something to reflect on and just be careful of, and that's also why I have this channel, so that we can recognize for people who are consumers of mental health, to be able to recognize what makes a good counselor, what makes a good therapist, how do we know that someone's practicing unethically. If you happen to find somebody who is practicing unethically or if it's not working for you, how can you speak up and advocate for yourself so that you don't get in this bind where you're being unnecessarily influenced by somebody who is actively harming you. But again, thank you so much for checking out this video. Please like and subscribe. Again, like I said, we'll be doing a Ruby Frankie sentencing hearing video here shortly. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. Again, thank you all for watching this video. I'll see you all next time.